Welcome to the Elliot Hulse Podcast. Podcast. I am the king of making men strong. Shedding of the old man, right? The way we can freely walk into rising, ascending, cleansing, sanctifying our soul for it's the Yo Elliot God. Show. I like that. Yo, it's your bro or your uncle, Uncle E, back with another show. And so I thought it would be interesting for me to unpack for a moment why I call myself Uncle E. Uncle E was a name that was given to my uncle, not me. And my uncle's name is Elroy, and he was my main mentor growing up. He taught me how to lift. He taught me about being a personal trainer and an entrepreneur. And in many ways, he was a second dad to me. You know, and so as I found myself in a place of male mentorship, making boys into men, making men strong again, uh, my archetype is reminiscent of my uncle, and I call him to this day Uncle E. And so I kind of titled myself that, but I love to hear it from the men that follow me. And so you can refer to me as Uncle E if you choose, Uncle Elliot or Yo Elliot or whatever the heck you want to call me, but I like Uncle E. And so today I would like to continue with our conversation about masculine initiation. In fact, we're probably going to speak on this topic for a number of sessions uh, over the course of the next few weeks because it is really the peak of service, the, the, the pinnacle of my deliverance, the things that I've done thus far come to a head with the things that we're talking about, masculine initiation. Um, man, there's so much I want to share, and of course my mind can go, but I'll begin with this. Last time we spoke about how there's a movement away from the world of mother, matter, material, sensual gratification, uh, effeminacy, and attachment. And then there's a movement to towards the world of the father. Now, this is not a knock against mother and an and a, ascent of the idea of the father, although we live in a world where it's ass backwards. Um, this is just a pattern that is recognizable cross-culturally when it comes to the growth of a boy into man. He must move away from his mother, right? That's biblical too, right? You got a boy, a man takes his wife and moves away from his parents. I think it's in Genesis, right? And so it's not a knock against those things that are represented by the mother either. They're good things. They're created things. They're material things. Material, maternal. Boy, I think our language uh, betrays us. Uh, but then a movement towards pattern, a movement towards paternity, a movement towards father and spirit. And that is marked by meaning, purpose, uh, mission, and being a worthwhile man to the people in your world. And so this whole idea that a boy should just know how to be a man is false. It never was and never will be. There has to be a cleaning of the slate from all of the spittle and baby food and blue pill, beta male buffoonery that's associated with childhood and boyishness, uh, and then a imprint of masculinity. It doesn't just happen. It is either facilitated or it's smash down upon you through crisis, <laughs> right? If, w if we're not aware of initiation and our elders aren't aware either, and there's no process, sacred space, or communitas, uh, then God comes down with his hammer and helps us do it anyway. And a lot of times it comes in the form of pain. You'll notice that a lot of young men uh, in their early teen years will actively subject themselves to struggles. I remember <laughs> I remember when I was about 13, 14 years old. Boy, this is so silly. And we would initiate ourselves. I initiated myself 
through the attention of girls. And I remember that there was this girl uh, that I liked and I knew she liked me. Uh, and it was at a friend's, she went to a different school and it was a friend's house, his barbecue. And we're standing on the top of a staircase in front of a house, you know, maybe four or five steps. And we're kind of laughing and giggling and talking. And I just had this urge to throw myself off the steps. Now, I'm kind of rugged. I'm kind of dense. I'm kind of, kind of a bull in a china shop in many ways. And so knowing that I wouldn't be phased, I decided to throw myself down the stairs. <laughs> Down the stairs. Of course, I didn't get hurt, but it was like I was trying to impress and I was trying to uh, show that I can handle stress. So funny. I think this comes to mind also. I think it was a movie uh, called uh, with Alicia Silverstone and she was like a dumb blonde and she was in high school clueless <laughs> and there was a boy at the party and he kind of did something similar he was like on his skateboard and he came down the steps and smashed his head and the girls came and put a put a cold compress on his head and were totally impressed by his uh his willingness to beat himself up well anyway what i'm saying is that deep within every boy there's a sense that i must be smashed there's a sense that i must be destroyed there's a sense that who i am is is required to die so that a new me can rise. And so we do all kinds of self-destructive things. Uh, those are some of the silly things I did, but sometimes we'd get into drinking or we get into smoking. Uh, self-destructive behaviors, getting tattoos, joining gangs, um, doing really dangerous things like driving cars fast. All these various things are, well biological and psychological in nature, and they, they beckon and call for initiation. So whether or not we're conscious of it, it's subconsciously or spiritually happening. So today, uh, of course, we spoke all about all this in the previous talks, but today I want to dive deeper into the first half. That way we can really proceed with great focus on the second half, we'll focus now and perhaps on the next few sessions on the masculine necessity for break, the clean break from the mother. And so this is both literal and figurative, but since most of us listening to this are probably not 12 years old, we're going to talk more figuratively because if we don't have a clean break, we carry our mommies with us all our lives. And this is why we have 30-year-old mama's boys. And you know this is true because if you look at even the biggest, toughest, most brutal football players on the field or MMA gangsters and guys who would rip your head off in a blink, even these guys, if you say something about their mama, they want to cry and act like a, act like a baby. Uh, say anything about my mommy, right? You see this with a lot of big black baseball, basketball players that want to save their mamas because they only grew up with one parent, a mom. So they want to save their mommy. I'm going to buy you the biggest house, mama. You don't need no man, mama, right? I'm going to take care of my mama. And so this whole idea of taking care of mama is uh, is a perversion, and it's not that you shouldn't care for your parents. You should. It's a, one of the Ten Commandments. But there's an unresourceful attachment to the matriarch in our society. I would invite you to look up. Uh, some people say it's a, it's, a, it's a lie, that it's not true, that it was made up. But it's definitely fascinating to look into. The Willie Lynch letters. You know, you know Willie Lynch letters? It was about how slave masters would break their slaves by removing the fathers from the you know, family unit. And then making the women afraid. And when a woman is afraid, uh, at, you know, because of the beatings that she gets or, you know, the mistreatment that she receives and there's no husband there to save her, with the children, she'll do two things, one with the boy and one with the girl. He'll make the girl real hard, real tough, real cold, real masculine. And then she'll teach her son to be soft. Don't talk back because you're going to get whipped. Be a good boy. Bite your lip. So you could see this playing out in our society. But I digress. So 
not all of us suffer in the same way with, uh, with that same type of attachment to mama, but if you have any kind of feelings towards her, be it anger, frustration, or fear, it needs to be dealt with. How is it dealt with? Through forgiveness. So in our King Initiation Program, 21 Day Challenge, kinginitiation.com, that's a plug. Uh, one of the things that I offer my men is to forgive their mothers. I do a whole session, a whole lesson on the dark mother. And for some men, it's really tough. I had a young man this week who struggled with this. He has a mother that has mental illness and has caused some pain in their lives, particularly the, you know, breaking up with his father. But he decides out of tender heart and compassion and a need for freedom in his life to forgive his mother. And so he goes to her and forgives her to her face and she blows up and says, how dare you? How dare you? Mama, I'm just forgiving you. I'm letting go for the things that maybe you didn't know. And so she grows furious. And my young student suffers as well. Fear and then guilt and then shame. You can tell that this was a, 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 a cycle, a system, a way of being in their home. But he's free now because he has released that from her, his heart. And it's up to her to either receive it or not. Fear of the mother. Don't think that there isn't fear. If you're not willing to speak to your mother up front about things that need to be revealed, then you're dealing with fear. So it could be this over-attachment son-husband sort of uh, incestuous relationship emotionally. Or it could be fear. It could be anger towards your mother. All of those are attachments because they're emotional. Any emotional attachment to the mother is unresourceful, especially after a clean break during the first initiation. And there's a consistent initiation in this way. Did you know this? It begins for a boy around the age of four. Freud called it the Oedipal Complex. So I may have said this last week, and I'm kind of harping on the mother before we move forward, and I'm going to talk about sensual gratification. But when a boy and a girl are born, they're both sort of asexual, meaning they have no sexual identity. In fact, they have no identity of their own. When a boy and a girl are born, or the baby comes out of the womb, it thinks that it's still a part of their mother. Psychologists and scientists tell us so, and it's pretty evident when you observe. We know, being individual beings, that when we look at that, we say, okay, that's silly because you're different. But you got to understand that the baby is knitted in the mother's womb. She, he is literally, he, she, she, he, is literally a part of the woman's body. Her body's making this human, and it's attached to the inside. The baby and the mother are one in many ways. The baby's different, has its own cells, its own circular system, its own brain and its belly, but it's one inside the womb. Once the baby's on the outside, it's only a matter of time before there's a love object relation loss. That basically means that what the child thought it was it quickly discovers it's not. I am not my mama. And hopefully that that first initiation that both boys and girls go through happens in a resourceful way. There could be a very um, a, 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 a removal that is that is incomplete, or it could be too harsh of a separation. And so, but I'm not going to go into that. The point is that that's an initiation that both boys and girls do. But at about the age of four, a boy begins to recognize that mommy and daddy ain't the same. And me and mommy ain't the same. And I'm a little bit more like daddy. And so there is a second sort of love object relation loss, meaning 
that not only am I not my mommy, but I'm of a different order altogether. This can happen smoothly if there is a father. But if there is none, there could be a wound. The girl doesn't have the same wound because he doesn't, she doesn't have to make that separation. But a boy is cut off from his source. That's the first sort of initiation or awakening that happens around the age of four. And I'm thinking of clocks right now. The clock that starts with 12. And so right about three o'clock, four o'clock, the light goes on. You go from spirit to mind. And then, of course, emotion to body. But that's a different conversation. So right about that time, right on time, we work on clocks. We live in a fractal universe that's based on laws. Right about that time on the clock, there is a break and an awakening. That's one. But then, of course, we know that the second one happens around 12 when we get to the top of the clock and there's a whole new life ahead of you. So according to Robert Bly in his amazing book, Iron John, which every man should read and read and read and read or listen to it on Audible. In fact, that's what I usually do. Listen to it probably more than any other book in my life. He speaks of the initiation process that happens with the, I, I believe, the Cherokee men. And he notes in his poetry and his, his, his studies that Cherokee men are known for their bravado. They're known for their brazenness with women. They're known for their uh, very masculine way of being. There's no question. And so this was noted by historians. Well, one of the things that you may not know is that the rites of passage initiation process that happens with a Cherokee boy, according to this book, is that when he's removed from the mother, as is all cultures, as all cultures call for, as he's removed from the mother at a time when it seems he's ready to be atoned with the father, he goes through his trials, he goes through his challenges, and then he's imprinted with the masculine the, the masculine stamp. But an interesting happen, thing happens that's unique to this people. When he comes back to the society, when he comes back to the tribe, he no longer talks to his mother. And you might say that's tragic. But you got to understand that these people needed strong men and they couldn't have men that were weak and weak-willed and addicted to mommy. There is a sort of seduction that the mama can have for their boys. I, 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 I know this sounds strange, but if you look at your own life or the people that are around you, you might see it. A mama who still has talents dug into the shoulders of her son. A, mother's who can, a mother who can still guilt, her, guilt him and shame him and uh, manipulate him into doing her every whim. <laughs> it happens. There's a lot of it out there. That is a boy who's still attached to his mother's womb, even a man. And so in order to uh, keep that sever separated, in order to maintain that new masculine frame, the, 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 the Cherokee now young man would only speak to his mother through a sibling or through a cousin or through someone else. Now, you got to understand that the mothers went along with this because they knew how important it was for their boys to stand on their own. That may be a stream, an extreme example, but look at where we're at today. It's extreme in the opposite way. <laughs> and no less perverted, perhaps more. So I emphasize greatly in my lessons in KI-21 this necessity for recognizing the dark mother in your life. I'm not saying your mother is dark or that your mother is bad. That's not really the case. But she doesn't know because no one told her and we live in a world that doesn't tell women about themselves. Have you noticed? It's okay to tell a man about himself, but women refuse to hear. And so in a situation like that, even if it was brought up, she may act out in a very vicious way. So it's important for men to know whether or not she knows this is the case. 
But it doesn't stop there. And like I said, it continuously goes. It goes and goes and goes as life is a spiral and cycle and we traverse the same roads repeatedly. We face the same challenges until they're overcome. And every 12 years, in a way, we find ourselves in the same place, a need for initiation. And so what does it look like for a man who maybe doesn't have mommy hangups? What does it look for, like for a man who has overcome his maternal, uh, the maternal matrix within? And I'll come, I'll circle back. There's so much to talk about. I can go on and on for days. This is not a rejection of the feminine within. There is a feminine energy, a quality within men that I believe needs to be honored. But it's when it's not honored that it becomes perverted and then we project it out on the world. Let's come back home though. What it will always, what it will often look like in the life of a modern man is addiction. Robert Moore says, wherever there's a wounded lover, wherever there's an addiction, he says, wherever there's an addiction, there's a wounded lover. And the lover is the sucker <laughs> of the four archetypes. Think about sucking, kissing, mouth, oral, right? And so wherever there's this wanting to lick, wanting to take in, wanting to gratify senses, <laughs> sucking on mommy's titty, there is a wound in that wound in that part of the psyche that causes us to latch on to all kinds of things. I can't get mommy's titty, so I'll suck on these video games. I can't get mommy's titty, so I'll suck on these cigarettes. I can't get mommy's titty, so I'm gonna suck down these suds and drink beer all day. And not only that, these drugs sort of give us a sense of ecstasy. I watched my wife nurse all four of my children, it's amazing. And when a baby latches on to his mama's breast, and I have three daughters too, so I'm talking about them too. <laughs> it was amazing. They may be crying and frustrated and crazy and red. And then she puts them to the breast and it's almost like they get drunk immediately. That's what we would say. And then we, she would take them off the breast and they would look like they're drunk. She'd say they're milk drunk, right? Baba drunk, drunk with the baba. And when she would put them on the breast, their eyes would roll back. Almost like, just to think about a crackhead. Think, <laughs> think about somebody sucking on a glass dick pipe. <sighs> oh, man. <sighs> sucking on it, eyeballs roll back. You sink into the chair. Right? It's a call for mommy. That's what it is. And of course, smoking crack pipes is an extreme example. But think about in your own life the various things you won't give up. And we don't have to look very far. Have you ever skipped a meal? How about that? Have you ever gone 24 hours without putting a morsel in your mouth? Hmm? Why is it that every time your body calls for water, you beckon to its call. Can you drive fast? Can you deny yourself? Can you remain vigilant? Can you keep a vigil? And not out for partying and watching Netflix and dumb shit like that, but like the Desert Fathers would do, but stand and watch all night. It's a mortification of the flesh. It's a challenge against our base nature, our lowest, which is our flesh, which is the animal inside. Why is it that every time you get a boner, you have to rub one off? Can you have a boner without watching porn? Let me ask you that, men, because I know that's a struggle for many. Just because you have an erection doesn't mean you got to blow it out. Do you have self-control or does your body control you? And we, I say body. And so that's where we begin. 
but it really isn't the even the it's not the spirit of the thing it's just the doing of it i spoke to you last time about thinking feeling being and doing and there's a lot of doing here but the doing is non-doing so it's like a removal of things austerity so a big part of initiation this removal from the world of the mother comes in the form of detachment and removing things from your life that you know you like. Coffee, sugar, donuts. But let's stay real plain and talk about food. In King Initiation, I have about 10 austerities, but they really all revolve around one. The main lever that give us the best leverage is to remove food. So if you're wondering what we do every Monday, we go three days for the first three weeks of every month with no food, 72 hour fast. In fact, I just broke mine a little while ago. I did this around the age of 36 when the Lord was calling me home, calling me to repent and recall, calling me to be initiated into the man that I am. And I spent an entire year following this exact practice. Three first days of every week, 72 hour fast every week, starting Sunday night. And I got to tell you, it transformed my mind. But you don't have to just hear it from me. Oh, I can't wait to share some of these videos that are coming out from the guys who've been through the program. There are men that have healing, spontaneous healings going on, pains in their joints that didn't go away for, for many, many, many years, disappearing by the power of letting go, by the power of refraining, by the power of having dominion over their appetites. There is a sort of, dare I say, a slaying of the demons. Various addictions that men thought they would never have any control over, that had a grip on them for years, are easily dropped. Why? Self-control. I think all dominion over self must begun, begin with a letting go. We live in a time, we live in a world with an abundance of information. And there are so many things to do and think that we're almost obese in our activity and mind. We're the same way a fat person who's stuffing their mouth with food is sick and bloated, so are our minds. And so is our time because we're always looking for something new to do. But initiation is different in this phase. It's about humility and non-doing and embracing the boredom of life. When you remove food from your gullet and you stop chewing on all this trash all day, there's an opening of sorts and you begin to see things and sense things and movements literally in the body take way. There's a stillness, a silence, a stoppage of activity that if you allow it will sink very deep. Now, it's amazing over the past few years, scientists have shown that there's a lot of physiological benefit to, benefit to fasting. But wise men of all times have known that if you want great things to grow, you got to let go and fast. Moses and Jesus are great examples. 40 days in the desert. So I invite you that if initiation is something that's unfolding for you and you're a little bit confused, and in your life you know not what to do, fast, my brother, fast. Fast for days and days and days. Embrace the pain. 
Love the suck. And stop filling your gullet with food. Your prayers are much more efficacious. And your meditation is that much more deep. Let go, let go, let go, my brother. And you need not nothing to eat. You can feed on bits from the soul and revelations from God. And the stillness that's nourishing, nourishing stillness. Stillness is nourishing. Emptiness nourishes. That's why I say embrace the boredom. When you give up things that keep you distracted, that's when you're really meditating because there's no movement in the body, uh, meaning digestion. There's no synapses and popping off of neurotransmitters in the belly and the brain. And so when there's just stillness, you may get uncomfortable at first. When you're not picking up your phone because the dopamine detox is a big part of what we do. When you're not picking up the phone every two minutes, when you're not popping on the music when you drive, when you're not eating sweets because you're bored or playing video games all night, you get to confront the beast. The demons begin to rise. Let them, allow them, stare deeply into their eyes. You're staring deeply into your own dark spaces that you've been ignoring all this time. I challenge you, my listener, to fast, but not just from food. Fast from all things sensual and sexy and seductive and fun. Anything that keeps you trapped. Married men, go on a sex fast. It's biblical too. Paul says in Ephesians, I don't remember. <laughs> we'll have to go and look. But in one of his letters, he says that it is my body doesn't belong to me and my wife's body doesn't belong to her. We belong to each other. I owe my wife my body and she owes me hers. There's no negotiation once we make that covenant. It's sealed. And of course, that's a whole topic for another day. But he says that only separate in times of fasting and prayer, but be sure to come back. It's Corinthians 7, 5. Thank you. <laughs> awesome, Carlos. Yeah. So there you have it. It's uh, actually, let me read that. Do you have it still there? Let me read it so I can get the words right. One day, maybe I'll be a Bible guy. Corinthians 7, 5. 1 Corinthians 7, 5. Abstaining from sex is permissible for a period of time if you both agree to it. And if it's for the purpose of prayer and fasting, but only for such times, then come back together again. Satan has an ingenious way of tempting us when we least expect it. And you know that what that's about, right? We don't want, we don't want to suffer that temptation, right? Wives who deny sex to their husbands don't subject them to, to that temptation. It's almost like you're committing the sin in that case but that's not the conversation for today so even if you're not a no fapper or a guy who jerks off to porn what i'm saying is refrain even if just for a little while it's a tough thing to even consider a lot of the men in the program have explained that their wives sort of freak out and you would think it's the guys that freak out but it's not <laughs> that's what we've discovered this first time through in king initiation We've seen that the men who make commitments and follow all the way through are firm. But then there are the people that they love that they also need to affirm. You know and she knows your love is true when you're not always having to have sex. Just imagine. Just imagine. And look. Again, for another show, but men and women love differently. And it is right for a man to have a logical love. 
and it's right for a woman's to be emotional. But that means that you've got to be able to see a woman without your sex goggles on. Now, of course, I'm against fornication because I've seen how it wrecks havoc in lives. But if you're boning a girl and you're wondering whether or not she should be in your world, stop having sex with her for a while. Ha! How clearly things start to show up. How clearly you begin to see. Sex goggles is a real thing, bro. And sometimes we got to take them off. But if it's your wife, you know you love her, but now you get to love her in a more logical way. You get to restrain, you get to refrain, and you get to have self-control. And as long as you console her and let her know that you ain't going to go nowhere, you're right here, all will be well, and I propose that your marriage will be even better. So these are some of the things that you can give up. These are the, some of the challenges you can offer yourself. These are some forms of austerity for initiation. One of the things I've experienced as well as the men in my program is that it's during these times when it's silent that the thoughts of the mind run rampant. This is the time when the demons creep in and want to bring up old shit or to derail your honest efforts or to plant seeds of doubt and jealousy and all forms of unresourceful emotions. Beware. And so, although we're talking about the stoppage of doing, what do we know? We also have thinking and feeling. So we live again in a time where feelings reign supreme. Not only that, but people believe that what they feel is always true. So much so that if you feel something, I must believe in you. For example, just because I feel like a woman doesn't actually make it so. And you can cut off someone's dick and balls and they still <laughs> ain't going to go. It ain't going to work. You ain't going to be a woman no matter how much you feel. And vice versa. But that's the peak of diabolical disorientation that we find ourselves in this world. That is the end point. That is the, that is the pinnacle of delusion when we allow our feelings to reign supreme. And let our feelings rule our lives. But of course, most of us aren't that uh, misled or disturbed or, or, or sick in the head. We have compassion for those people. Absolutely. It's a tough time to be alive. But what about rampant monkey mind thinking about things that may have happened decades ago? What about feelings that are unresourceful from trauma when you were eight years old? What about feelings of inadequacy or even sense of grandeur and grandiose inflation that want to make their way in. That's all an attachment to feeling. And so I have a little bit to say about that. All feeling is true. Hear me out. This is going to be very fascinating and interesting to you. I'm going to give you some tips about how to be, especially when you're initiating yourself into manhood. All feelings are true, meaning that they are there. It's literally there. You can't negate a feeling. Just like if I slap you, you'll feel my hand across your face. If I stomp your toe, you'll feel my foot on your toe. If you ate something bad and you got pains in your belly, that's a feeling as well, too. So we had a uh, young man today during one of our calls. He said, Elliot, I don't know what's going on. It's been happening since the fasting. I'm waking up in the middle of the night and I have overwhelming fear. And I, and I asked him, then what are you afraid of? And he doesn't know. I says, I just feel it. I have no idea. It is just a movement 
in the body. That's why it's called feelings. If you don't have a body, you can't have feelings. Emotions is just energy moving and creating sensation in the body. Just feelings. It's no different than getting kicked. It's something's vibrating and moving and creating a stir within the physiology. So just because I'm skilled in the process of fasting and masculine initiation, I put myself through these rigors. I knew exactly what he was dealing with, but I'm not a know-it-all, so I asked questions. So I said, then, if you're having these feelings of feelings, <laughs> these feelings of fear, what are you doing about it? He says, well, I don't know, really know what I'm afraid of, so then my mind starts to race. And you start thinking fearful thoughts as a fruit of the feeling place. You feel the feeling and then feed it with thought. And so he saw the how it was a terrible loop. He was looped in with these feelings that then got trapped in his thoughts, which produced more feelings, and he had hard, hard time trying to fall asleep. What a, what a terrible mess he found himself in. Think about people who are depressed that have a sunk feeling in the body and then make up their mind about what it is. Can you feel depressed without feeding the beast and just let the emotion pass by? This is having sovereignty over the mind. Dominion over your inner dialogue and the things that you choose to think. So I told him, my friend, fasting gets your adrenaline pumping at all kinds of weird times at night. This is why people think that they have more energy. They say, oh, when I start fasting, I have all kinds of brand new energy. Well, yes, that's because your body's pumping more adrenaline as a result of many different physiological things, including a detox pathway that requires adrenaline to support it. So I asked him, or in fact, I told him where he was feeling it. <laughs> he, he, his eyes lit up and he's like, whoa. I said, so when you're sleeping, because I know, when you're sleeping, you feel that fluttering in your solar plexus, like right underneath your rib cage. And he was like, whoa, how'd you know? And I said, because that's where fear resides. Emotions choose places in the body to uh, experience, for you to experience them, feelings. Based on where in the body there's a movement, the feeling is associated with it, right? There's, there's feelings in the heart. Have you, ever, have you ever had a broken heart? Check out how you actually feel in this area. Ooh, it, it's almost like a caving in, boo. Is an emptiness. Ooh. Oh, like somebody punched you in your chest. Oh. Right? So it's neither here nor there. And it's what I'm saying is not scientific. But if you pay attention, you'll notice it's true. Most people are, a lot of us are schizoid in a way, like cut off from our bodies. But if you're in tone with your body, if you're in touch with your body, you'll notice what I'm saying is true. So because I know where fear resides, which is in the diaphragm, the solar plexus, I said, when you have that feeling in your diaphragm, there's no need to judge it. It's just movement. The minute you associate it with something, the minute you think about something that it might be about, the minute you give it some uh, context or content, you turn it into something it's not. You pervert the feelings. So all, let me go back. All feelings are real. All feelings are true. It's a feeling in the body. But the incessant thinking and thoughts that you attach to it are totally of your creation. You can choose to have dominion over your mind, which will, which will lead to emotional control. This is a part of initiation. This is a part of letting go. This is a part of mortifying the ego and relinquishing the will the will wants to have control so if you feel fear especially as a man you want to do something about it we are problem solvers by nature so you feel this feeling and you think you got to attack it you got to do something to resolve it with your mind 
but it doesn't work that way. By simply deep breathing and allowing the muscle to relax, all the quote unquote fear lets go. It's all gone. That's another part of having sovereignty over the mind and the body and becoming a clean slate for an imprint. And so my fellow man and man on the initiation path, if you're listening to me here today and you want something more in your life, understand that it's not about doing more stuff. It begins with a letting go. If you want a new life, you got to clean the slate and it begins with the break from the mother. The mother in your mother, but also the mother inside you, the matrix and the mama's boy who's attached. Where can you let go? You don't need to go out to the wilderness or to the top of a mountain or anywhere special for this to happen. Although, that would be a very good idea. Ooh, and I have something coming up for you that will be like that. I'm bringing back initiation camps. And so we could do this live together. It's called Grounding Camp, and one's coming very soon. I'll tell you more about it later. But you can do this at home, like me and my students do. You could do this at home by beginning with a fast and seeing where it goes. That is my invitation to you, men, young men, and men of old. If you have unresourceful attachments and you have a sense that you need to let go and grow, fast my man, from food and all things that really slow you down. And so I'll leave you with that. I want you to consider what in your life do you need to mortify? What kind of detachment can you grow? And then when we come back for our next show, we're going to talk about atonement with the Father. Until then, keep growing stronger. Uncle E, I'm out. Thank you.